I have very little in common with the President of the United States, but one of the few things is a, a general distaste for um, prepared remarks. Um, <laughs> and I, um, I actually made an exception to my, my usual rule is that if I don't know about a subject well enough to speak about it extemporaneously, I have no business speaking about it at all, and so I don't use prepared texts. But I, I was sufficiently moved by this uh, that I uh, departed from my usual practice uh, and I actually took the time to write something down partly because I want to post it to Lawfare and partly because I actually don't really trust myself to improvise on this subject and so you'll pardon me for reading what I'm about to read uh, but it is actually a, a reflection of uh, how moved I am to be here and uh, how uh, grateful I am to all of you for, for uh, thinking about our work the way you apparently have. So, Salam didn't mention this, um, but earlier in our acquaintance, uh, back during the Bush administration, when I, shortly after I went to Brookings, I suggested to some folks at the Defense Department that they uh, bring him down to Guantanamo Bay uh, to do some briefings there or to have some briefings there and to sort of get a site visit uh, with respect to ongoing detention operations there. And uh, they were quite receptive to this idea and, and the result is that Salam went there. And so, you know, let me start by saying that it isn't every day you get presented an award by somebody you helped send to Guantanamo. Um, sorry, I couldn't help but include that. I mean, um, so uh, the jokes aside, I'm, I'm really moved to be here. And I, I, when my colleagues, Bobby Chesney and Jack Goldsmith, and I started Lawfare uh, seven years ago now, we I, I'm sure it's true of them too, but I can only speak for myself. I could never have imagined the role that it was going to come to play in our current political debate. Uh, we thought we were starting a personal blog for the three of us to write, you know, nerd stuff about national security law. We started it to give practitioners in government, scholars and journalists, technical legal guidance about hard questions that they faced and that, to be clear, some of them faced in abstract ways that scholars and writers write about things, but some of them faced in their immediate professional lives. You know, these were urgent questions. Whom could you and could you not lawfully detain at a place like Guantanamo? Under what circumstances is it lawful or reasonable to target people with lethal force using a drone or using ground forces? Whom can you reasonably subject to surveillance and under what circumstances? When can the president use force to deal with a security threat on his own and when does he need to go to Congress first? Those were the sort of things we thought we were starting the site to write about and for much of its history, that's what it has done and it continues to do those things. Even then, we faced the occasional need to differentiate ourselves from people who use the language of national security to propagate bigotry. So if you visit Lawfare, for those of you who, have, who don't know the site, and I really hope you do, but be sure to spell it correctly. Because if you leave out the blog in our URL, lawfareblog.com, or if you otherwise misspell the name of it, you'll find yourself in one or another really Islamophobic corners of the World Wide Web. I don't know what percentage of Frank Gaffney's traffic to his website comes from people who think they're going to lawfare and mistype our name, but it's a measurable percentage, I think. Um, that's been a sore spot for me for a long time. Uh, and we've had long had to be careful always to distinguish what is genuinely necessary and useful in the national security space from what just might rile up a crowd, and always to separate ourselves from those who don't bother to do so. That's an old problem for us. Uh, it predates the site, uh, but as long as lawfare has been there, we have had to do that work. 
every day. And what is not an old problem, it's a new and dangerous one, is the rise of national leadership that does not care about this distinction. Sometimes it's merely careless about the difference between the pursuit of genuine national security goals and the expression and exploitation of bigotry. And sometimes it's far worse than careless. Um, those of us who advocate robust national security authorities, and I am such a person, we do so knowing that the burden of those authorities don't fall in, they don't fall equitably on individuals or communities. When we argue that the government should have the power to do X or Y, we do so aware that X or Y will often disproportionately affect some communities, including unfortunately yours over and above what it does to the community at large. Sometime back, to cite only one example of this, the FBI said it had open ISIS investigations in all 50 states. Now, I don't think that's true anymore, but it was you know, a year and a half ago. Some of those investigations, even assuming they are all entirely appropriate and lawfully conducted, will adversely affect the lives of innocent people in the Muslim American community. And those of us who believe in robust counterterrorism authorities, we shouldn't ever pretend otherwise. And we shouldn't shrink from the special duties on us that belief in those authorities conveys and creates. So to be specific, we have a particular duty to distinguish between tools and measures that are genuinely necessary to the security of the country and actions that are ideologically or bias-driven impositions on the life of, lives of innocent people. To the extent we advocate policies that will burden people's lives, we accrue a special responsibility to speak up about policies that impose such burdens too broadly without meaningful security benefit or without adequate checks. And to the extent that we defend policies that many people believe gratuitously target Muslims, we have a particularly special obligation to speak up against policies that actually do. Perhaps most importantly and least discussed, those of us in the national security business have a duty to understand the adjective we use in the phrase national security. The, the national part in an inclusive fashion, which is to say we always have to remember that it is a liberal democratic society whose security we're protecting. And if the Muslim American community, both as a large aggregation of individuals in that community and as a collective within that community, is not secure in this society, then we have not succeeded in realizing any vision of national security to which we should reasonably aspire. So if our national leadership has forgotten these fundamental duties, uh, or if some of our leaders never understood them in the first place, uh, there is a piece of good news and that's that the men and women who populate the American national security bureaucracy have by and large not forgotten these duties. Uh, shortly after the first travel ban executive order came out, I have to be careful about how I talk about these people. I was approached by a counterterrorism officer of a US intelligence agency. And he told me that he and a group of his colleagues wanted to put together a public event as a fundraiser uh, and they wanted to do it uh, on behalf of Lawfare and an organization that would, was helping Syrian refugees. Uh, if you think about the sort of people in your mind who want to do a fundraiser for Syrian refugees, this guy didn't look like those people. Uh, the event never came off for a totally unrelated reasons, uh, but this, that's really not the point. The point is that he and his colleagues intuitively understood that in the security of a liberal democracy, the security you're defending is the security of liberalism itself. I think that intuitive understanding is still the norm among tens of thousands of people who do national security under the rule of law 
every day in the depths of what has so disgustingly come to be known as the deep state. We founded Lawfare to write about what we call hard national security choices, still on our masthead. These are agonizingly hard questions with real costs in all directions and often no good answers. These days, we write a lot about a lot of dumb national security choices. I haven't worked on a hard one in more than a year. Should we keep all people from Chad out of the United States? <laughs> What's the legal status of a presidential tweet in an administrative proceeding about the integrity of an executive order? How about this one? Is it okay to fire the FBI director and then boast about it to the Russians while giving them highly classified operational information? <laughs> These are really easy really dumb national security questions. And I would so much rather be here tonight talking with you about some difficult policy question which involves a choice where I might have to support something that many of you might feel you had to oppose. This is actually how I met Salam many years ago. Um, I don't want to be having this conversation, and I know none of you do either. But as long as our society needs a remedial course on the distinction between true national security, the security of a liberal society that protects individuals and minority groups in the exercise of their freedoms, and the theatrics of national security demagoguery, I see no choice but to give that course and to draw as loudly and publicly as I can some sharp lines between the security we should and should not be seeking. And I am so very grateful that our efforts in that regard have meant something to all of you. Thank you.